Is that too close? Okay, I got some thumbs up. You guys are very helpful. I saw some thumbs imme up immediately in the back row with my students. It's like pulling teeth to ask them, you know, if they can hear me. Uh, thanks uh, a lot for inviting me. Uh, Grant and uh, all the faculty who've been so welcoming, the students that I've gotten a chance to meet and uh, hear lots of terrific questions from. And uh, I, I've had terrific, I've learned so much. I've gotten terrific advice. I've met a lot of interesting people. I hope I don't do a terrible job so that I get invited back. <laughs> so in order to start by you know, being thorough, I've written things on the board. Just so when I mention things in the course of lecture, you see what, how they're written, you have a little bit of information about them. So it's not just uh, something I say, you know, like a word of Okay. <clears throat> I'm, I'm going to talk tonight, uh, Carl, about um, uh, some themes of uh, religion and secularism, uh, public life and private life. And I would like us to, to think about what these, what we mean by these words, what they can mean. Um, when we talk about religion, is this something that is, uh, is or should be private? Um, is it something that's public? Uh, what does it mean for something to be private or public? Uh, what does that mean? You know, what kind of assumptions do we bring up with us when we talk about these terms? When we talk about the secular, uh, what does it mean for a state to be secular or for society to be secular? Does that mean that it is free of religion? Does that mean that there's freedom of religion? Uh, what does that mean? Does that mean freedom of religious practice, whether it's public or private? Uh, does it mean freedom of conscience? Um, uh, is freedom of conscience something that's private or is it also public? Uh, so these are terms that are all very complicated, but I, and, and I don't necessarily even try to resolve everything I just talked about in you know, half an hour roughly. But I want you to keep these, these concepts in mind because I think you'll see that they, are, they come up repeatedly in the discussion. Uh, what I'm going to try and do is talk about just some maybe important themes that come up when I think about uh, how Muslims talk to one another and a lot of the questions that non-Muslims have about Islam and about Muslim life. I'm going to try and cover some common areas of controversy, uh, but in the process I'm going to try and uh, I'm going to do that through maybe a, like what I think is a coherent discussion about some of these, these themes. Okay, I'm going to start out with two a little anecdotes, one um, from the ninth century, one from nine days ago or so. Uh, uh, one, uh, you know, uh, bloodier than the other one, right? More violent. So in the, in the, some of you may have heard the story, in the ninth century in the city of Cordoba, which is in, now in southern Spain, which was the capital of Muslim Spain until it was uh, captured by uh, Christians in the year 1236. Uh, in uh, in uh, mid 800s in Cordoba, there were a group of Christian monks from a nearby monastery, and a series of them came to uh, one by one over a couple of weeks, came to the Sharia court, the main court in Cordoba, this sprawling, uh, diverse cosmopolitan metropolis under Muslim rule. And uh, a, a one, this one Christian monk went. His name was Isaac. He went into the court and he said he wanted to become Muslim. The judge said, well, that's great, you know, come on in. And he proceeded to unleash a torrent of abuse about the Prophet Muhammad. The judge was stunned. Uh, he started crying. He was shocked. He asked that this person was crazy. Get him out of here. The youth insisted on continuing to insult the Prophet Muhammad. Um, the judge, again, asked him to stop, asked him what was wrong with him. He insisted on continuing to insult the Prophet Muhammad. Eventually, the, the judge had him put in a, a cell to cool down. He gave him time to reconsider what he was doing. The, youth, uh, the young monk con continued to insult the Prophet Muhammad, and then the judge reluctantly had him executed. And this uh, led to a series of what's oftentimes called the Martyrs of Cordoba. You can read about these um, you know, in the internet, on the internet, or wherever. So lots of stories about the Martyrs of Cordoba, a series of young monks who willingly go and martyr themselves. And if you, you, as you recall clearly from this story, the story, the, the young monk was given numerous chances to not insult the Prophet Muhammad and to say that he had just been upset or crazy and, uh, and everything would have been forgotten. But he chose, he intentionally sought out the path of martyrdom. Okay. Um, the, the second uh, case, which happened actually just a few days ago, and I, I find it very interesting. I found myself thinking about it a lot, even though it's, maybe not that important in the grand scheme of things. 
a, a young Muslim um, avowed feminist. In fact, I don't actually know her actual name. Her blog is called The Fatal Feminist, which may be good or bad, I'm not sure. That's her blog name, The Fatal Feminist. And she wrote a, a blog post, which got a very controversial in the American Muslim community, uh, talking about how she, as a Muslim woman, does not love the Prophet Muhammad. And that she has a lot of problems with the Prophet Muhammad, a lot of unease with the Prophet Muhammad, with his life, the way he was involved with women, uh, with uh, a lot of the body of Islamic law that's based on the Prophet's conduct and the, 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 uh, the revelation of the Quran. And uh, this also, you know, as you can imagine, caused controversy. And in fact, just a few days ago, a very prominent Muslim scholar in North America devoted his Friday sermon last Friday. To addressing this issue, not directly addressing the blogger by name, but at least you know, it's clear he was responding to her. Um, a, a lot of unease that Muslims have this idea that a Muslim would come out and publicly, um, you know, not necessarily insult the Prophet Muhammad, but say that Muslims were not obliged to love him or that she didn't feel comfortable with him. And this is really shocking uh, for Muslims to hear. Now, these two stories are, are related, but they're different, very different from one another. And I think show us different ways of in which notions of religion, public, private, secular, are understood. In the first case, the martyrs of Cordoba, the judge doesn't care what is in this young Christian monk's conscience. He knows the Christian monk doesn't like the Prophet Muhammad. If he liked the Prophet Muhammad or thought he was a prophet, he'd become Muslim. Okay? He's not a Muslim. He's practicing Christian under Muslim rule, and it doesn't matter what he thinks. It doesn't matter if he hates the Prophet Muhammad deep down in his heart or if he talks to his other monk friends about it. But to come out in public in front of a Muslim judge in a Muslim court and say this, that was threatening the public order, the public world. And that's what he was punished for. So it's a public manifestation, not private conscience that matters. In the second case of this blogger, when there was the, the, the response of Muslims to her blog was a lot of Muslims were very Christian. How can you talk this way about the Prophet? He's unacceptable. And uh, one of her responses was, um, this is a free country where we have religious freedom and uh, no one can tell me not to express the gender. So here we see her appealing to the notion of freedom of religion, which is here, you know, both freedom of conscience and freedom of expression. But what's interesting is that another response she had is that her, her freedom of conscience necessarily involved her sharing her ideas. So it, it's not freedom of conscience if you just think something and complain to your friends about it. Part of being a religiously free person in America is to get up and testify, testify about this feeling. Testify about these doubts, testify about these insecurities. Um, perhaps because that's what it means to be a sincere person, but also because other people need to hear so that they can say, ah, I also have this problem. I agree. There's a there's almost a communal therapy element about it. So you can see here in the first case, the notion which the judge is saying, I don't care about your freedom of conscience, your private conscience, that doesn't matter. We don't care about that. Public, the public display is a threat. In the second case, it's, uh, this blogger is insisting both on her private freedom of conscience, but also on the public element of that freedom of conscience, even if it threatens what some Muslims may perceive to be their public order, because as this blogger says, that's not how public order is run in America. Public order in America, it can't, it, we don't have, we're not allowed to appeal to religious sentiment when we talk about public order. Public, the public space is a, a space in which religious sentiment doesn't matter. Okay, now I, I bring this up uh, because it's very important we think about Islam, and especially as the Sharia. And the Sharia is the idea and the ideal of God's law. It's, it's the, the, the Muslim understanding of God's law. And you know, Islam, like Judaism, perhaps less like Christianity, is a religion that is, expresses itself primarily through law. And the Sharia is a comprehensive body of law. That, you know, most of it is about prayer, fasting, ritual purity, things like that. But it's a comprehensive body of law that involves everything about human beings' relationship to God and also human beings' relationship to one another. 
But it's very important we think about the Sharia and Islamic law as it is a public order. It is a system of public order. That's one of its most important facets. Um, the Quran specifies that there is no compulsion in religion. People cannot be compelled to believe in any religion. You can't be compelled to become Muslim. You can't be compelled to become Christian. Uh, but this is a private matter. And when it comes to religious identity, Muslim scholars have a principle, which is that God has ordered us to rule by the outward and not to look into people's hearts. So uh, Muslims, as, and, as legal actors, deal with one another and deal with society on outward appearances, not by looking into what people, what's in people's hearts or in their, in their, in their souls or in their consciences. Um, what's very important is how your public ma religious manifestation affects this public order of Islam. So there are, in the Islamic tradition, very clear public pillars of religious veneration and respect. For a Muslim to say something negative about the Quran, for a Muslim to disparage in any way the Prophet Muhammad, is unacceptable according to the, the tradition of Islamic law. And this is an extreme case by a scholar from the, from actually from Cordoba in the 12th century, before this martyrs incident happened, but he's a little bit extreme, but it gives you an idea of how, far. he said that if you were to go up to someone and call them, this is the second time I'm asking if I can curse at BYU, I'm not, if you were to call them the son of a B word, okay? <laughs> And it turns out that that person's mother is actually descendant of the prophet. Even if you didn't know that, you would be executed. I said, that guy's an extreme case. But it just goes to show how, how uh, protective Muslim scholars were of the, the Prophet Muhammad's person. The Prophet Muhammad person defines the boundaries of the Muslim community. The Muslim testimony of faith is there's no God but the one God. And Muhammad is the messenger of God. Muhammad tells you what God wants you to believe, and what God wants you to do. And his person, his memory, draws the boundary of the Muslim community. Um, this, uh, this notion of public order is also extremely important, not just in the way that Muslims deal with themselves or understand their law or their relationship to God, but also the hierarchy of Islamic civilization. So Islamic civilization, which we could spend a while defining, but Essentially, that area of, of land historically or those peoples and societies that over which God's law, the Sharia rules historically, or continues to rule, um, was for many, many centuries majority non-Muslim. Places like Egypt only became majority Muslim in the 12th, in the 12th century. Uh, Iraq, 12th century. Anatolia, only 15th century, you have the majority of the population Muslim. So, uh, Muslims spent many, and until the modern period, uh, Muslim majorities rule over non-Muslim minorities. Sometimes, like in India, over non-Muslim majorities. But there was a clear hierarchy in Islamic civilization. Muslims were on top. Under them were these protected religious minorities, the Zimnis, who had the freedom to practice their religion, but did not have the same status as Muslims. And People like to complain about, oh, see, Islam is uh, discriminated. By the way, I'm Muslim. I don't know if it's, you know that or matters. Just, you know, FYI. Sometimes I forget that people might not know that. Well, I'm Muslim. Um, the, people like, oh, see, Islam is discriminatory against other religions. But think about this. In order to enter that elite class in Islamic civilization, you just have to become Muslim, which takes about three seconds. In our society, in our country, we deprive lots of people of full rights, whether they are residents, uh, immigrants, uh, undocumented people. And those people, there's very little they can do to change that status. So, I mean, it goes, just think about that for a second. Which, which system is more discriminatory? I'm not trying to take sides. I'm just saying food for thought. Food for thought. Um, so this was, uh, this hierarchy is extremely important. What this monk had done, what these monks, these martyrs of have done is they've come and challenged this order, challenged this public order, this hierarchy. Um, this, uh, if a Muslim left Islam, let's say a Muslim said, I'm not Muslim anymore, I want to become Christian. 
this was also a serious challenge to that logic, right? You could go from a lower level in a low, you know, a non-Muslim minority and enter the elite, that sort of affirmed the logic of the society. But if you were to leave that ruling group and go down, that challenged its, uh, the, the dominance of Islam, the, the kind of ultimate truth of Islam. But again, it's public performance that matters, not private conscience. And a great example of this is in the 9th and 10th centuries, there's a series of Christian of, of Muslims who convert to Christianity in Egypt and Iraq. We know about this because uh, their stories are recorded in Christian books of martyrdom. So it's actually Christians telling these stories about Muslims who become Christian, not Muslims telling the stories. Every one of these people, Muslims who become Christian, they all get executed. Because what happens? They become Christian, and then the monks who guided them on the path say, now go forth and proclaim your new faith. They go forth, they proclaim their new faith, and uh, then uh, they get executed for apostasy. Except one guy. <coughs> the monks tell him, go forth and proclaim your new faith. And he says, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. He, go, he becomes a monk. He lives his whole life in a monastery, write, writing books. In fact, he's writing books against Islam. He lives to a ripe old age and dies a natural death. What's the difference between these cases? It's not the fact, you know, they were all Muslims who left their religion and became Christian. The question is, did they go out and publicly manifest it? By the way, the guy who survived, his father wrote a letter to the ruler in Egypt saying, my son has apostatized, you need to have him executed. And the caliph didn't care, I mean, the ruler in Egypt didn't care, he was uninterested. So it's, it's, you, even if you, this is being brought to his attention, because there's no public element, he, he had no interest in, in punishing this person. Okay. Um, when we think about the, the functioning of law here, it's very important to remember that Islamic law, the Sharia, was de developed and elaborated in a pre modern context. In a pre modern context. You, know, you might say, oh, that's obvious, Professor Brown. Thanks a lot. Why is that important? Because of the very different functioning of law in modern states. Very different functioning of law in modern states. Um, Islamic law was a public law in the sense that it involved relationships of individuals to the government, relationships of individuals to public order. But it was primarily, primarily a private law, i.e. the relations of individuals to one another, through contracts, through property, through relations of individuals wronging one another. Um, and of course, it was more than anything in relation to, between individuals and God. Right? Through things like prayer, fasting, uh, ethics, uh, charity, the Hajj, the, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Um, it's a, a law between people who fear God and between those people and God. And the, the private law element was so important or so dominant uh, not because Muslims didn't think that you know, there's a lot of matter there or material that individuals have as a relationship between them and the state, but simply because pre modern states were puny. They were tiny little things. They weren't like governments today that reach into every aspect of our life in terms of how, you know, how many exits does this room have? How many people can fit in the room? Uh, has it gotten tested out for fire safety? You know, does your back deck have a hand railing on it? I just found out that my, I need to get a hand railing on my back deck. I think it's 18 inches tall, which apparently is too high for not having a hand railing. So, you know, the, what color can you paint your house? Uh, what can you say on the radio? What can you say? The, the idea of a state that gets into every aspect of your life, education, family, child rearing, everything. This is not the way the world functioned in the pre-modern period because States did not have the capacity to do this. They didn't have the technology, the manpower, the funds to do this. People, communities ran themselves. Families, extended families governed themselves. Uh, there was not a lot of public law because the public, the, the state itself was a small actor in human life. The, the role of Muslim judges was therefore not to sit as vehicles or dispensers of the state's power, but rather to help individuals restore 
justice and, uh, and, and the status quo ante in their relationship with one another. They aimed at restorative justice, not punitive justice. And they wanted to, they were able to help individuals through the, the, the law of God, help individuals rectify their relationships with one another, claim their rights and responsibilities. Um, this is very important when we talk, when, when you hear about something that most of you, I'm sure, have heard about since it appears in pretty much every movie that involves Muslims, even tangentially, which is the Hadood law. Everyone's heard about these Hadood, you know, so, you know, Muslims are always getting their hands chopped off and always getting stoned in their movies, like hit with stones, not uh, smoking hot, right? Yeah, this is uh, one of the things Ask Americans about Islam, they're going to say stoning, hand cutting, stoning, hand cutting. Uh, you can sit there if you want. I'm not. I'm not going to be sitting down anytime soon. Um, these laws, some of these laws, are actually mostly found in the Quran, which is unusual because the Quran is actually not a very big book, and a lot of very central tenets of Islamic faith and practice are not mentioned in the Quran. Five daily prayers, not mentioned in the Quran. These things come from the precedence of the Prophet Muhammad. The Quran does not have a lot of legal material in it, but it does have these Hadood crimes intoxication, fornication, slander. It doesn't have apostasy, that comes from the, the, the precedence of the Prophet Muhammad. But what you, what you find in the case of these laws, these laws that, are, that God describes as the boundaries of God, these are, these are offenses that are particularly offensive, these are sins or crimes that are particularly offensive to God. Something very interesting about them. The Quran says that if somebody fornicates, they will be punished by a hundred lashes. Hundred lashes. If, however, if you accuse some of, for, of fornication and you do not have three other witnesses who actually saw that act of fornication occur, then you will be punished for slander with 80 lashes. So think about that. If somebody fornicates, they get punished with 100 lashes. But if you accuse someone of fornication, like how is someone else, how is somebody going to get punished for fornication? They can confess, or someone's going to say, I, you fornicated. If you don't have four witnesses who saw the act, the person who makes the accusation gets punished by 80 lashes for slander. So what you have here is a very harsh punishment but at the same time, an extremely high, if not impossibly high, evidentiary bar for the crime to be proved. Just to show how hard it was to prove this, in the 500 years that the Ottoman Empire ruled Istanbul, Constantinople, there was only one instance of fornication being punished. There's a lot of fornication that happened, I assume, <laughs> right? But only one instance being punished. Why would you have extremely severe punishment but almost impossible to bar evidence. Because this law is not meant to be applied. Not because God says, here's a law, but I don't want to apply it. But because states don't have the capacity to go around policing. They don't have the pre-modern states don't have the capacity for preventative police or investigatory work like law and order. And they certainly don't have the energy for preventative policing. You know, someone to sit around and make sure you're not speeding on some remote highway. So the only way, because states can't be out there patrolling people's lives, people have to be terrified into not committing sins, to not committing crime. They have to know the, the massive proportion of these sins in the eyes of God. It's this, this is not just in the Islamic tradition. It's no coincidence that in, the, in Britain, in the year 1820, there are 200 death penalty offenses, 200, including stealing firewood, uh, stealing uh, fish from someone's fish pond. These are death penalty offenses in Britain in 1820. 1830, police, the, the Scotland Yard Police Services started in Britain. Uh, 1850, countries uh, unified by railways. 18, by 1860s, telegrams. Right? The end of the 1800s, by 1900, you know how many death penalty offenses there were in the UK or in Britain? Four. You went from 200 in 1820 to four in 1900. Why? 
Did everyone just get enlightened all of a sudden? No. Suddenly you actually have police and a state with the infrastructure to punish and to investigate crime. By the way, just like the Hadoop, people didn't get put to death for stealing firewood. If someone got, uh, was caught uh, stealing firewood, the, um, well, something that would happen is, for example, they would reduce the value of the thing stolen from the, the amount that would require a death penalty to a lower amount, which would require, you know, some kind of year in prison, something like that. So just like the Islamic tradition, you have these very uh, severe punishments, but the, the, the way that the court actually functioned would reduce them in practice. Okay. The reason why I bring this up in the case of um, the public and notions of, of public religion, private religion, and what's that, is that so many people are getting seats. That's good. Uh, there's a lot of debate in the Muslim world and between Muslims and you know, non-Muslim states or non-Muslim um, voices in the public square about what Muslims should say about the Hadoop. And there's a lot of pressure for Muslim intellectualists, like me, for example, to condemn the Hadoop punishment. Professor Brown, we want you to condemn the stoning in the Quran. We want you to condemn, uh, you know, lashing in the Quran. But what this reveals is, are two very different ways of thinking about the function of law and religion. So, as a Muslim, I believe these are the punishments ordained by God. But I believe that in the, the same book that ordains these punishments, the Quran, and in the precedent of the Prophet Muhammad, it's been made clear to Muslims that they are not that these punishments are almost impossible to apply. And that their objective is not to uh, be applied in reality, but to communicate to Muslims the enormity of these sins. For let's say a non-Muslim critic, maybe a, a typical American intellectual, what they see in these uh, in these punishments, in their mentioning in the, the Quran and in the, the books of Islamic law, is they see a unacceptable imposition of religious morality in public life. And a sort of medieval severity of religion in, manifested and enforced in modern public life. So what they're asking me to do is to deny these things in principle when denying them in principle for me means denying the word of god when in fact i don't actually call for these things to be enforced in practice second so first we talked about these issues of martyrs of cordoba and the feminist uh, fatal feminist blog the second point i want to make is Islam is both a liberal and an illiberal tradition. And you see, a lot of times the Muslim intellectuals in the West feel a lot of pressure to say Islam is a liberal, liberal tradition. You sort of trot out this example of how, you know, here's Islam's liberal legacy and poets and wine and some kind of party, right? There's going on and there's great scientists and literateurs and all these things. But Islam is both a liberal and an illiberal tradition. What do we mean by liberal? We could have a whole discussion of liberalism. But generally, what we mean by liberalism is a system that privileges the right over the good. What it means is that we are skeptical about our ability as a society to agree on what is good in life, what goods we should aim at as individuals, or as families, or as a society. But, so what we want to protect is people's rights to pursue what they think is good, provided they're not trampling on other people's rights to do so. So Islam is illiberal because Muslims, like the practitioners or the serious practitioners of other religious traditions, or many other religious traditions, Muslims believe they know what's good. What's good is to worship God and do good deeds. That is what's good. In fact, we're so sure it's good that we want to go and tell other people that they should do that too. Does that sound familiar? Right? <laughs> want to go and talk? But if we're sure that's good, 
if we're sure that what's good is to believe in the one God, believe in the message of the Prophet Muhammad, and follow Islam as he uh, communicated to us, why should I allow someone else to come and propagate a religion that I don't think is correct? Now he gets tensions around issues of proselytization. I'm sure, I'm guessing Mormons discuss questions of proselytization a little bit more. Yes? Okay, there's some nodding, a lot of nodding, that's good. And a thumbs up. What's it? <laughs> right? But here, here's the question. Yet Muslim societies, in general, not all, but in general, are not fans of non-Muslims proselytizing. Why? You could say, well, because Muslims don't understand freedom of religion. What do we, what do we mean by freedom of religion? If you say, we believe we have the correct religion, and this is what's good for human beings to follow this religion, why would I invite people to come in and sell something else? I mean, I wonder, I mean, I'm curious, I, I don't have time to get it, maybe you guys can tell me in the Q&A. If you had a, if there was a Mormon state, not a, like a U.S. state, a Mormon polity, where everybody was Mormon, would it be okay for people to come and promote other religions in that state? I don't know the answer yet. Well, maybe someone can tell me afterwards. Now, Muslims, no, Islam is not a liberal tradition, it's an illiberal tradition because of the Quran and the precedent of the Prophet Muhammad to communicate other things that Muslims believe to be correct. They believe that there is a proper uh, understanding of marriage, a proper understanding of the family, a proper understanding of sexuality, a proper understanding of public morality. And um, there's no reason to allow that to be subverted when we know that's good. So a, a liberal society is in many ways premised on a at least a notional public skepticism about the, the uh, a widespread understanding or consensus about what's good in a metaphysical sense, in a spiritual sense, in a moral sense. And that's why people have to have the right to pursue their own notion of good because there has to be this free market. Because we don't know as a society what's right. We can't prohibit individuals from pursuing their own notion of good. Um, Muslims know that alcohol is an evil. They know that interest and exploit, exploited interest and usury is an evil. So why should these be permitted? Um, controversial. If Muslims know that the Sharia, the rule of God, is good for people, that people should be invited into this and given a chance to ad uh, adopt it, shouldn't they spread it to other places? Or you get to the idea of jihad. Why did, why did classical Muslim scholars think that it's the obligation of the Muslim community to expand the rule of God's law? Not forced conversion. Remember, Muslims don't accept forced conversion. But to expand the rule of that state that rules by God's law to give other people a chance to enter into the religion of God Muhammad. Um, just to, uh, as a kind of side note, this is another point on which it's really important to keep in mind the distinction between the pre-modern and modern, or maybe pre-Westphalian, pre-United Nations uh, understanding of international relations and the post-Westphalian, post-multilateral organization notion of international relations. Prior to like, you know, the sense, let's just say the 1700s, the assumption was that the default state, the default condition between states was that of hostility. Yeah. Either you expand or you expand it on. Unless you have a treaty with someone, they're presumed to be hostile to just your enemy. This is a case when, when Muslim scholars are writing about the obligation of jihad, they always say, you, don't, you cannot attack non-Muslim neighbors or non-Muslim states with which you have a treaty. So Muslim scholars today, or most Muslim scholars, will say, yes, there is an obligation for expansionary jihad, but that doesn't really apply when States today exist in a default assumed uh, relationship of peace with all other states, unless war is declared. So the, the law is the same, it's just the context has changed. Is that clear? Does everyone understand what I'm saying? He says yes. Anyone else says yes? I just want to, okay. I, know, I, know, I got another yes over there, another yes. I feel like I'm an auctioneer. Okay. Now, I said 
Islam is both a liberal and an illiberal tradition. So far, I've been doing a bang up job of proving it's illiberal. I'm, not, I'm definitely not a very good proselytizer, so this is, uh, can't be too that. How is it a liberal tradition? Okay. In some, in an important sense, the Islamic tradition is more liberal than Western European and American understanding of society and religion. In fact, Muslims in, in Islamic tradition, in one sense, is so liberal, it would make Western Europeans and Americans a little queasy. Um, despite the fact that Muslims believe that the Quran and the Prophet made very clear what is good, and they made very clear that the correct choice is to embrace the message of the Prophet Muhammad and worship the one God and do good deeds, they gave people the right not to do that. And in the Quran, preserved in the Quran and in the precedent of Muhammad, we have the Prophet Muhammad, we have the right of non-Muslim communities to continue practicing their religion under Muslim rule. Think about that. Uh, a society which says the good is clear, but we are actually acknowledging the right not to do that. And we are acknowledging and protecting your right to do things that we consider to be religiously reprehensible. Muslim scholars allowed Christians to drink wine and produce wine and consume wine, to raise pigs, eat pigs. They, they allowed um, incestuous marriage. This is something that's theoretical. Really, it's not really, wasn't really common in Zoroastrianism, but in Zoroastrianism until the 1300s, there was the possibility of mother, uh, son, father, daughter, and brother, sister marriage. Um, probably a lot of, not a lot of Game of Thrones watchers in here. <laughs> I don't know, but that, that happens in Game of Thrones. So this is, all right, they allow, Muslim scholars had a debate about this, and the general position is they will allow Zoroastrians living under Muslim rule to engage in incestuous marriage, even though this was absolutely reprehensible for Muslims, because this was part of their religious law. This was part of the Zoroastrian religious law. So Muslims protected non-Muslims' right to practice their religion, and to engage in practices that Muslims themselves consider absolutely reprehensible. For example, um, Muslim rulers in India allowed um, Hindu uh, noble women, especially Radcliffe women, to engage in sati. Sati is a widow self-immolation, where a widow would throw herself on the, the fire of the funeral pyre of her uh, dead husband. Muslim uh, rulers allowed this. The British banned it in 1829. But there is a caveat, there's a condition. Muslim scholars around the late 700s, early 800s, based on their understanding of the Quran, the precedent of the Prophet Muhammad, the facts of the early Muslim community, derived what's called hukuk al ibad. The, the main word that the Quran uses to talk about human beings, they talk about human beings as the slaves of God. So hukuk al ibad literally means human rights. It's the rights of human beings. So you heard it here, Muslims invented human rights. Go find a use of the word human rights prior to 800 and I'll, 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 you know, I'll change my opinion. Uh, later on they expanded this to more, but the, the three main ones are the right to physical inviolability, no one can come up and hurt you or kill you without some just cause, right? You can't just go to Professor Underwood and kick him in the head without facing some consequences. No one can take away your property without just cause. And you have the right to practice religion. Any religion. But religious practice could not mean a violation of these other two rights. So, for example, the Prophet Muhammad, in a letter to the Christians of the city of Nidran, the Dhan is today inside Arabia, that's right on the border of Yemen. He writes a letter to them saying, you get to keep your churches, your cross, your bishops, we're not going to mess with you at all, but you can't engage in interest, in usury. You can't engage in usury. Why? Because usury is violating the property rights of others. 
these Hindu noble women, when they wanted to, to perform sati, they were allowed, but they had to go to the Muslim governor and get permission. Why? So the Muslim governor could make sure they weren't being forced to do it. Because if someone forces you to do it, they're violating your right to physical inviolability. You want to do it yourself, and that's, that's part of your religion. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I'm just going to talk really loud. Does that work? I got, oh, great. The music will come back on. Um, I hope I'm not talking really loud at that moment. <laughs> so, all right. In this sense, Islam is a very liberal tradition because Western Europeans, you know, Western Europeans and Americans cannot accept, for example, the idea of minorities that have marital practices that the majority consider reprehensible. Things like polygamy. <laughs> now it's working. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, the British could not abide, could not morally accept the idea of a widow throwing herself on the pyre of her husband. And by the way, it's interesting when you read the, what is the 1878? Is it Reynolds or Davis? Reynolds. I should check this out before I start my talk. If you read the opinion in that case, the judge talks about polygamy and sati in the sense of this is just like sati. This is reasonable human beings cannot accept this. Muslims accept it that other religious traditions do things and think things are right that Muslims don't agree with. And if that's part of their religion, it has to be protected, provided it doesn't violate these three basic human rights, which all human beings have, Muslim or non-Muslim. Okay. Finally, I want to end with a uh, discussion about voices that contest all of this. You know, I, I started the talk talking about this, you know, this judge in Cordoba in the ninth century and this blogger in the 21st century. Both are Muslims. Both see themselves as speaking for the religion or as voices of that religion as qualified participants in religious life. And these are two very different uh, eras, two very different contexts, two very different understandings of who has the right to speak for Islam. Is it the, the classically trained Muslim scholar who studied for years in a school of law and is a, a judge, or is it a lay intellectual who sees uh, his or her right as a modern person with reason and um, all the enlightenment and tools of the modern world, is it that person's right also to sort of pour in their bucket into a greater discussion about what's right and wrong for Muslims, what Muslims should or shouldn't think or do. The uh, <coughs> Islamic tradition, historically and well, you know, for many people up until the present, was a solid core of certainties surrounded by a thick uh, thicket of probability. So there are certain things that Muslim scholars understood to be what they called the essential tenets of the religion, things known axiomatically as part of Islam. There's only one God, Muhammad is the prophet of God, Muhammad is the last prophet of God, you have to believe in angels, you have to believe in the Quran, you have to believe in previous prophets, your fornication is prohibited, theft is prohibited, intoxication is Prohibited, five daily prayers are required, the cat tax is required, um, uh, sodomy is prohibited, right? These are, you know, you might come up with a list that's maybe half a page long. These are the things that are known, all Muslims agree on, all Muslim scholars agree on, and if you deny one of these things, you uh, are not really, you can't really call yourself a Muslim. Outside of that, every other issue of Islamic law, how exactly how do you pray? Do you pray with your hands like this or like this? Do you bow like this or do you raise your hands and then bow like this? Are you Sunni or Shia? Um, do you think that you should uh, pray your afternoon prayer at a certain time of the day or later in the day? Um, do you think that um, you can uh, engage in certain interest-bearing transactions or you can't engage in certain interest-bearing transactions? 
You think you can eat shellfish or you can't eat shellfish? These things are all uh, questions on which Muslim scholars have opinions, but they acknowledge that disagreement on these issues is not in any way a factor establishing. And in fact, these disagreed upon issues can change over time and perhaps should change over time as context changes. So for example, uh, is it okay for men and women to shake hands? The vast majority of opinion of Muslim scholars would be, pre-modern period would be no. But then you find yourself in a, let's say, Western European American context where shaking hands with the opposite sex is completely normal and totally offensive if you don't do it. At least that's my experience. The Mormons shake hands? Good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, otherwise, I would have been like offending people today. The, the, uh, you know, now that you know, a lot of Muslim scholars are like, well, this, this issue, there's multiple opinions on, so maybe we should switch to the, you know, the opinion that allows shaking hands. Because, I mean, really, what's, what's the big deal about shaking hands? What's changing? Or, you know, uh, can you get a car loan? if you need a car so that your daughter can take the car and be safe instead of being on the bus, things like this. Are, and these are issues where there's disagreement. And so maybe these opinions should change as needs change and as context changes. Uh, one of the big changes, one of the big transformations in Islamic discourse in the modern period is that until roughly the mid 19th century, the people who spoke for Islam were the ulama, the Muslim religious scholars, people I've been talking about this whole time. Ulama means the people who know, scholars. They were the people who elaborated Islamic law and dogma, who applied it in courts, who worked as administrators, who worked as teachers and medrasas. But beginning in the 19th century, as uh, Muslim, different Muslim states begin building universities that are built along modern Western um, Western lines, and you have uh, the idea of a, let's say, a literary scholar or a historian or a scholar of religion in the Western tradition. Uh, people who would we would look at today as lay intellectuals, Muslims who are lay intellectuals, also see themselves as participants in the discussion of what Islam is, what Islam should be, what Muslims believe, and what they should believe. And as that uh, circle grows, um, like it's grown for the rest of our society, it's not just professional journalists who write journalism anymore, it's bloggers. It's not just uh, professional film critics who write film criticism anymore, it's you know, your friend who likes to write sci-fi uh, film criticism. Uh, it's not just a qualified scholar of Mormonism who writes about Mormon theology, it's, I don't know if Mormons do this, it's whatever Mormon decides they want to have an anonymous blog, whoever Muslim wants. So uh, there's a huge expansion of the people who are claiming to be spokespeople, or at least voices in a qualified and legitimate voices in the discussion of what Islam is and what Islam is. And at the same time, part of this discussion is that many of those fixed points of inquiry, those things that I mentioned as being those axiomatic tenets of religion that cannot be challenged, um, many Muslims especially Muslims in the West, not necessarily Muslims in the Muslim world, Muslims in the West, uh, are calling for a lot of those points of fixed points of inquiry to be challenged. Because they say, you know, these points, these positions must be changed as morality changes. These positions about marriage must be changed as our understanding of marriage changes in American society. These understandings of sexuality must be changed as our understandings of gender and sexuality change in American so this is one of the, 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 I didn't want to talk too much about this, because I don't think this represents really the Muslim world of, as a whole, but it really represents Muslim life in the West. The, the most consuming debates amongst Muslims in the West aren't over things like apostasy or hadood. It's about uh, issues of gender, issues of sexuality, issues of the family, precisely those issues that are um, very controversial in American society, perhaps Western society. So, I hope I've covered I covered a number of controversial issues people usually have questions about: Hadoo, jihad, apostasy. Um, 
and I'm happy to answer any questions you might have or hear your comments and any you know challenges or disagreements you might have. Thank you. one can ask for. Okay. Yeah, questions. Ask questions in the meantime. Nobody has questions? Uh, I'll take two questions at a time. That's more efficient. Why don't you come up here if you can, or if you have a moving voice, boom away. Boom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, good question. Could you repeat the question? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll repeat it as I when I answer. That's why it's good news. Okay, next question. Yes, you. Uh, my question is in the context of communicating with an audience that doesn't have very strong backgrounds mm -hmm. on Islam. I think, especially within America, a lot of information is received about groups that. So when someone talks about Islam in America, there's a pretty good chance that they're talking about Daesh or ISIS, mm -hmm. and they're like what that means is Islam. And so within that, and like an example of something like martyrdom that over time has developed where like originally like a very religious subject, but in Palestine with the PLO and then throughout the Arab Spring, there's these developing definitions of it that becomes more and more a like civil religious idea that's still drawing on these concepts of religion. How do you separate like discern between those two when you talk to people how do you explain that there are like it i think like this idea of like the especially in palestine like there are religious backgrounds but for the plo it was very much mm -hmm. like a political and nationalist movement and how do you like acknowledge that there are like there's religious symbolism going on there mm -hmm. but it's not uh but there's a distinction between like i well, I think my understanding of the things you said, like your understanding of Islam and um, like specific acts within like their spring or the PLO uh, in terms of martyrdom. So how do you okay. address that? Okay, so the first question is about, uh, you know, how does authority function in Islamic tradition? I mean, there's no pope, uh, how are decisions made, how are, are the kind of traditions disseminated? Um, so in the Sunni tradition, which is the vast majority of Muslims, about 85, 90% of Muslims are Sunni Muslims. Uh, there is no, I don't know, there's like about 1.5, 1.6 billion Muslim in the world. Um, and even from the very beginning of Islam, it starts out as a, a huge geographic expanse um, in which local traditions emerge very quickly. So in general, uh, the people who speak for Islam are not the Muslim rulers, who are essentially just um, political authority, although they have some capacity to choose to enforce certain laws or ask certain laws to be followed. But the law and Sharia is developed by these Muslim scholars, the ulama, and they are the people whose opinion determines what Islam is. They speak for Islam. Uh, what happens is 
Um, over time, different schools of law and bodies of opinion coalesce into four schools of law in Sunni Islam. So basically four different bodies of law in Sunni Islam, and uh, maybe two or three schools of theology. And so uh, people follow whatever is the you know, the school of law that is in where they live. So if you live in Morocco, everybody there is follow the Maliki school of law. If you live in, you know, Jakarta, everybody there follows the Shafi school of law. If you live in Delhi or in, you know, Karachi, everyone there, everyone there follows the Hanafi school of law. And within those schools of law, there are established historical authorities, a text that people would go to as the main references. And in the present day, in whatever present time you're living in, there are, you know, there are certain scholars who emerge as particularly authoritative. How do they emerge as such? Um, combination of their peers' recognition of them, of their knowledge, and of their understanding, and then of um, popular acclaim, which creates an interesting dynamic. Because if Muslim scholars are supposed to guide the masses, but at the same time, if your authority comes in a great part from the masses looking to you as an authority, you can't push them too far. You, can, you know, you can't say something that's too far outside of what they'll accept. So there's an interesting dynamic of like, you know, where's the power? Is the power with the scholars or with the, the people who are claiming? Uh, so it's very decentralized. Um, and as I said, mostly the kind of uh, the historical or trans-historical consistency of the Sunni tradition comes through this idea that there are certain things that everybody agrees on, and these are uh, cemented by what's known as consensus, or ijma, consensus, which is the most powerful authority in Sunni Islam. And there's other things that are disagreed on, but the range of disagreement is accepted, right? So we know that there is a certain number of positions on this issue. There's a certain number of positions on that issue, and that's okay, as long as you're within the, the outer boundaries of what's acceptable. The Shiite tradition is more uh, ordered. I think perhaps because it's smaller and more uh, geographically centered in Iraq and Iran and Lebanon. Uh, so they have a, a very clear system of Certain people were called Ay Ayatollahs, sign, which means sign of God. They're scholars who are considered to have graduated from a specific course of study and then have the capacity to engage in legal interpretation. And if those sc scholars get become well known enough and respected enough amongst the population, they are what's called, uh, they become what's called marja. Marja means a religious authority. Marja means religious authority. And so what a Shiite Muslim would do is they would just pick one marja and follow that person on whatever. And that person is not liable before God. For if that marja makes a mistake, the lay person who follows them is indemnified. It's like, you know, if I have an accountant or something, I'm going to screw up my taxes. Maybe I'm not liable. I'm not sure that's true. But it would be like that, right? Because so if you follow one marja, and that takes care of all your problems. The Sunni Islam doesn't have this formula. A lot of people might follow a certain scholar they like, but uh, they might pick and choose between different people. And it's, just, it's not this uh, ordered and centralized. The second question, well, there's a lot of people. The uh, second question is about uh, ISIS and martyrdom. So the, I know you're not saying this, but I'll take my chance, your chance to, to say this, which is it's very funny that when Americans, you know, talk about sometimes they say, "Oh, ISIS is the true face of Islam." And never a couple of years ago, there was a debate about is ISIS Islamic? Is ISIS the real face of Islam? The, the irony of that is there's not a lot of things that all Muslim scholars agree on today, but every Muslim scholar I know of, Sunni, Shiite, Sufi, Salafi works for the government, hates the government, lives in Southeast Asia, lives in South Africa, lives in North Africa. They all condemn ISIS either as heretical or apostates, except the scholars who work for ISIS. Okay? <laughs> so basically what this, what this means is the only people who think ISIS is a true case of Islam are ISIS and these people in the US who say that. 
which I think is really ironic because it means these people in the US who think ISIS is serious Islam are actually the only supporters of ISIS. <laughs> that's not, I know that's not what you're saying, but okay. The other question, you know, about martyrdom is really, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff to answer in this question about suicide bombing, but just in general, the general, the agreed upon rule by Muslim scholars, you can't kill civilians in warfare. You can't, there is a, a majority opinion that you can kill civilians if they're collateral damage. So let's say you can only kill the enemy if you bombard this building with a catapult. That's the example they use. You could do that. That's not the position I take, but to be clear, I take the minority opinion, which is that you can never kill civilians. The way that Muslim scholars who justify things like suicide bombing in Israel Palestine. Uh, their argument is not a necessarily religious argument. What they say is this is a case of necessity, that we don't have any other means to uh, inflict casualties on the enemy. Or they say that Israeli civilians are not soldiers because they all serve in the army. That's a bad argument because Muslim scholars, the argument in Islamic law isn't that you can't kill civilians, you can't kill non combatants, you can't kill soldiers if they're off the battlefield. This other argument that Muslim who want to engage in, you know, let's just say terrorist attacks on civilians. The argument they use, and sorry, this is a repetition of what I said earlier today. Some of you were there. It, they don't use an Islamic argument at, at all. They use a perverted democratic argument. So if you read the writings of Osama bin Laden, which have all been translated in English, he says the, uh, it's okay to attack American civilians. Why? Because America is a democracy, and American civilians choose their policy. Therefore, they're accountable for it. Which is, ironically, the same argument Alan Dershowitz used in a, one uh, documentary, documentary I saw to justify the Israeli government's uh, bombing of Gaza, civilians in Gaza. That's not a Muslim argument. It's not a religious argument. It's a perverted democratic argument. Uh, and the, the last thing about you know, um, martyrdom, yeah, that's a, I mean, it's a very interesting notion that uh, Something that is, you know, all all cultures and religions would see that there's certain good way to die. There's a beautiful death that goes into the three countries. Um, but uh, it's ironic that this term martyrdom is when people think about it today. They use it generally as a scare. The last area question we will address this very quickly is, you know, how do you, you know, let's say, you know, I'm a Muslim or, or you're someone who wants to educate people properly about Islam, and someone comes up to you and asks you about this controversial issue. How do you answer in a way that's both accurate but also isn't going to is going to try and dispel ignorance as opposed to sort of compound it? That's a really hard uh, balance. So, I mean, just look at my talk tonight. Maybe some of you go away saying religion's weird. I don't like that. I mean, I would have failed in my duty as a Muslim to convince you that my religion is correct, but I think that I have would have succeeded in my duty as a scholar. To convey information to you in a way that may help you understand the historical tradition. And I, I have to balance between those two. And it's a very difficult to do, and I, you know, I feel guilty all the time. Next question. So this question, you kind of answered it with Jaren's last question. So kind of a follow-up is um, the term radical Islamic terrorism. Um, mm -hmm. From my understanding of Islam and what you've been talking about, it's a pretty oxymoronic phrase, radical Islamic terrorism. So I just want to, I'm curious as to what your response to that phrase is, because it is such a widely used phrase in radical American Radical Islamic news. terrorism. Yes. That's okay. Good question. If you don't mind me asking, are you a revert? And follow up to that, um, how has your experience, or if not, um, how have you seen other um, reverts to Islam um, sort of integrate into the community? Mm. Okay, uh, so, okay, two questions, I'll answer them both. First question was about uh, radical Islamic terrorism, is it a, I mean, you know, I, I think it's also important we, we acknowledge what's being talked about here. So, uh, you know, Muslims, some Muslims do engage in just 
absolutely unacceptable, horrific attacks on civilians. And I condemn that. And you know, if you you know, some people say, why don't Muslims speak out more? I don't know. Muslims trip over themselves to condemn terrorism. They do it so much they get tired of doing it. And there's this one high school student, a Muslim high school student. If you go, there's a I think it's a website called MuslimsCondemnStuff.com or something. She wrote a compiled a spreadsheet of just thousands of examples of Muslim individuals and scholars and organizations and public officials condemning ISIS or terrorism or whatever. Muslims condemn this stuff all the time. And I mean, to the extent that, yeah, okay, Muslim groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS do horrific stuff. And if Donald Trump and other people want to say that's bad stuff, I agree with them. But uh, we should also acknowledge, you know, what's going on behind that statement. So when when Donald Trump gets up and says radical Islamic terrorism is bad, he's not just saying that, you know, these groups are specifically bad and we don't like what they're doing. What he's saying is uh, all Muslims that we're suspicious of or they have political views that we don't like are potentially these people, supporters of these people. And uh, moreover, these groups who are doing this are monstrous and are coming out of nowhere and there is no cause for what they're doing and therefore US foreign policy has no responsibility or culpability or is not a cause in any of this. Uh, and I, that stuff I totally disagree with. That stuff I totally disagree with, right? Uh, it's it's uh, extremely important, extremely important that Americans and other people in the world distinguish between uh, Muslims who engage in unacceptable acts of violence and Muslims who have political views that are unpopular. Americans can have different political views. That's our right. People in other countries can have different political views. That's their right. Um, and finally, you know, uh, if Americans don't understand that our policies abroad and the millions of Muslims that we've killed in the past uh, uh, 30 years, just since 2003 in Pakistan, Afghanistan, and uh, Iraq, some uh, 1.3 million Muslims, if we don't acknowledge that these actions injure a lot of people and create a lot of enemies, then we're just being naive. And that's it. I mean, like the famous Onion headline, new Pentagon bomb, new bomb developed by Pentagon creates 1,000 terrorists a single blast. So we're just being, it's being rid ridiculous to think that you can deal death around the globe and it's not going to create any enemies. I, as an American, want to minimize the number of people who want to hurt me, who want to hurt my family. I think that should be our government's policy. Okay. Um, the second question of the young lady about uh, me being uh, my convert to Islam. Yeah, I, I, I became Muslim when I was 19, so I never drank legally. Uh, <laughs> pretty interesting, right? I guess it's not a good audience for that. <laughs> so the, yeah, I mean, no, I, so I'm, I should have to pay a tax on how well I've been treated by Muslims. No, no, when I went throughout the Muslim world, I always, Muslim countries, you know, it's a big generalization, but it's accurate. They're very hostile. And then I spent a whole summer in Iran. No one cared. No one cared. For a second, they just were like, you're American? It's like being a Martian or something. They would, you know, I, would, I stopped even reserving hotels where I go to different cities. People would just invite me to stay at their house. People I met on the train on the plane. Um, and, uh, you know, this, this, it's kind of unfortunate. I think maybe being white guy, you get treated really well. I think sometimes people who are, you know, African American converts to Islam or other minorities, they don't get treated as well as white people, which they're guilty of that. I don't support that, but I think that's enough. Okay, next question. So first, I just want to say thank you for this whole day. It's been really long. You've seen a lot of me today. Um, so this this question kind of has two parts to it. So in the United States. Um, as far as living Sharia goes, and you were talking about schools of law earlier, mm -hmm. we don't necessarily, I guess there's two options. We either don't have a school of law, or this is kind of a convergence of so many schools of law mm -hmm. that there's so many to pick from. So can you as a Muslim, from your point of view, live Sharia to its fullest mm -hmm. or to its fullness? And then is an, an Islamic government essential to living Sharia law? 
or can it be lived under the American legal system as it currently stands? Oh, two very good questions. Okay, next. Um, I'm just curious about your opinion on the future of the ulema and the madrasas and kind of how it relates in this Western society with the rise of social medias and people having a more uh, louder voice in the Muslim community and what you think that future is. Okay, thank you very, very good question. So, um, you know, Muslim minorities in uh, non-Muslim countries is, is an interesting question. But historically, the opinion of Muslim scholars has been Muslims should live with other Muslims. Uh, ideally, Muslims shouldn't live in non-Muslim as in non-Muslim lands, but they can if they're allowed to practice their religion, and if they have the capacity to educate other people in those countries or to proselytize their religion, then there's actually a benefit to them being. So, um, Muslims in in America and generally Muslims in the West are allowed to practice their religion freely. Um, if we, if for example, Muslim women were prevented from wearing headscarves. If Muslim women, if Muslims were prevented from, from, from praying, if Muslims were forced to eat pork or something, then that would be another question. And actually, you know, there's a number of states, I think last count, I think I counted 17 states in the US that have passed or are trying to pass laws prohibiting the Sharia. I don't know what that means. But technically what it means is that me praying is illegal in Tennessee or something like that. So I, now, I'm not saying Muslims should leave Tennessee, but if, if, that, if those laws like, became realities, then that would actually be grounds for Muslims not wishing to live in that place. Um, uh, but okay, so the nature of the Muslim community in a, in a, in, is important in answering the question of what school of law they follow. So for example, the Muslims in Germany are mainly Turkish, Muslims of Turkish descent. Uh, they all follow the Hanafi school of law. Muslims in America come from all over the place. South Asian, Arab, African American, Southeast Asian, everywhere. Uh, so there tends to be more of like a mixing and matching between these different schools. The third uh, possibility is what's called, and I think it's sort of these things all coexist, is what's called the, ju the jurisprudence of minorities, fiqh al qaliyat. The idea that Muslim minorities have special legal needs. And so they can, uh, let's say, like mix and match more. They don't just follow one school of law. They can take, you know, I did give this example earlier today. You know, there's most Muslim schools of law considering dog, consider dog saliva to be ritually unclean. So if dog saliva got on your pants, you'd have to change your pants before you prayed. You have to wash your pants. Um, that's tough if there's people with dogs in your neighborhood, dog will come and licking you. So maybe, you know, in this case, you would take the position of the Maliki school of law, which doesn't consider dogs to be unclean. Uh, it, it, you, you, know, you might have another issue like uh, our, um, okay, uh, for example, can you have, when does the Friday prayer time come in? So Friday prayer is a weekly communal prayer. Friday is a work day in America. You would go during a lunch break. But sometimes in the year, in some places, the Friday prayer might be way after lunchtime. So can you have Friday prayer before the noon prayer, the normal time of the noon prayer? Most schools of law would say no. You have to wait for the noon prayer to come, which might be, let's say, 2 p.m. or 3 p.m. The Hanbali school of law says no, you can have the, the, the Friday prayer even before that. So uh, mosques in America basically all take that opinion because it allows them to keep the Friday prayer time during lunchtime. People could get off and go work. Uh, I think those were the questions. Yes, next. All right. Uh, to ask a personal question, you said you joined, you, you converted to Islam when you were 19. Mm -hmm. Could you describe your process and, and your upbringing and why you oh. chose Islam? That, that couldn't have been an easy decision. Yeah, yeah that's interesting. Uh, that's uh, okay. Good question. Next. Okay, so my, check, my question probably isn't as technical or scholarly as some of the other ones that you've gotten. No big deal. Okay, great. Uh, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, the individual relationship with Allah and like how he works in your life and yeah. Very uh, touchy. Yes. Last one. My question is kind of related to the last question too. You know, I'm asking this obviously out of ignorance because I don't understand or I don't know. But according to Islam, what is the nature of God? 
Um, is he in a corporeal body like mm -hmm. you and me, or is he spiritual? Does he fill the expanse of space? Mm -hmm. uh, what is his nature? What is his what are his characteristics or attributes? Mm -hmm. Okay. Ooh, that's a good one. Okay, so my conversion story, uh, I'd say look it up online, but there's so much horrible stuff about me online. <laughs> it's, it's not a phobia, it's not pretty. What can I say? So, uh, I mean, I, I, became, I was raised Episcopalian, which is like American Anglic Anglicanism, which is like a yeah, Catholic about the Pope, they say. Uh, but I was, my, I was, my family, we went to church every Sunday, and I was an acolyte. I went to full, like, course of acolyte work. But oddly enough, the religion played zero role in our family, which is kind of odd. I don't know how these two things coexisted, but I was by far the most religious person in my family, but no one ever talked about God in my house. So I, I had very um, little attachment to Christianity because it was just this thing that I did on Sundays and no role in my life otherwise. But I was, I was very like religious. I believed in God. Um, and I went through maybe your normal upper middle class white teenage massive angst phase. <laughs> you know, read uh, Taoism. I went to high school in California. That didn't help, you know. So I, was, <laughs> I mean, I, I just was like, you know, I guess I was fortunate. And then when I went to college, ironically, Georgetown has a religion. I went to undergraduate at Georgetown. Georgetown has a theology requirement. Which kind of backfired in this case because I took the random Azure class on Islam to fulfill my theology requirement, and I just was really interested in it. And then, I don't know, I just felt like this was the religion I believed in my whole life. And it was interesting you say it was a courageous decision. I think that was the, the word you used. Uh, I think, I mean, I don't want to poop, you know, a little myself or my religion, but in a way, I think it was a naive decision. But I don't, maybe idealistic is a better word. I, I don't, I didn't, I was a completely idealistic. At the point of my life, I just made decisions based on pure idea. But the, no thought about consequence whatsoever. You know, I thought, if I find the truth, I have to follow it. This is the truth, I have to follow it. I didn't think about, you know, what this would mean for my family, my friends, my possibility of running for public office, all these things. Like, none, <laughs> not this stuff crossed my mind. And only later on, as time went on, I realized that the impact of have on my life. I don't regret it in any way, but I wonder sometimes, you know, so now I'm married, I have kids, you know, thank God, and I wonder like if I were to encounter, like if I were, you know, to still be whatever I was before and to encounter Islam now, if I had that same realization, if I would have the courage to alter my life so much, um, I don't know if I would. Um, okay, uh, I did write something online one time ago, I think I didn't pick the title, someone else did. It's like from Wasp to Muslim or something. If you look that up, oh, it might be the only thing that has a title. Okay. Relationship to God. That's, that's a, you know, it's interesting. I, I'm a very like private religious person. I'm not a very, um, I don't do like public religious performance very well. And Muslims are always saying like, mashallah, God, you know. I'm a lot, I always think about God and crying and things like that. I'm not very good at this stuff. For me, it's a very private uh, experience, which is hard because it's hard to talk to my kids about that. It's hard to, you know, you think, you know, other people ask me about it. But I mean, there's moments in my life that I go back to uh, moments of fear, moments of terror, um, when my, my, the truth became clear to me. You know, one one time I was, you know, I had been Muslim for about a year. I was actually in West Africa. I was traveling from the city of Mopti to Mali to Jenin in Mali. And this bus was so crowded and hot and overnight. I was I got sick, really sick all of a sudden. I thought I had like a bowl or something. But it was really terrifying. I mean I was really sick. And I uh, I had this it was the most honest moment I've ever had in my life. I said um, in my mind, I said, this is BS. God has never done anything for me. Which, looking back, I find fascinating. I didn't say, you know, there is no God. I said, God's never done anything for me. Which interesting to me is that in, in, in Arabic, the word for unbelief, kufr, 
It doesn't mean unbelief, it means denial and ingratitude. As if denying God isn't, you know, you can't really not believe in God because God, like, you're just born to believe in God. What you can do is deny God and be ungrateful. So that was this profound moment of, of denial in my heart. And then this, when I said that, it's not like I had a revelation or something. You know, when sometimes you just voices, your own voice comes into your head. And I just read this verse of the Quran that says, uh, uh, did we not find you an orphan and guide you? Did we not find you a poor and enrich you? Did we not find you? Now, did we not find you an orphan and raise you up? Did we not find you poor and rich and enrich you? Did we not find you lost and guide you? And after that, I was just filled with euphoria. I just, I mean, like complete truth was revealed to me, like the structure of the universe. I just remember feeling like life and death were the same. There's no difference between them. This is Boundaries in life and death are doing. That moment was really the truest moment of my life. And whenever, and you know, of course, you go back to your regular life and the, the curtain and the veils of reality of, of, of the world cloud over reality and, uh, and truth, and you are delude, you know, deluded away from from God. And but whenever I, I always try to bring back myself back to those moments, especially that moment. Uh, last question: the notion of God. Um, the nature of God. So this is a big debate what this God is God. I mean, as, as, as in other traditions, in other Abrahamic traditions. Um, there is a lot less uh, comfort in the Islamic tradition with discussing the nature of God, in part because it's not such a central and immediate issue. So the question of, if you have a Trinitarian view, you're immediately plunged into debate about the nature of God and the nature of the different persons of uh, for Muslims, God is unified. There's just a question of what God's nature is. Um, so God is not corporeal. The Quran says, Lesa kamisli There is nothing like unto him. Uh, our senses cannot grasp him. So God is outside of creation, totally. Um, beyond our perception. The nature of God is beyond our perception. In fact, there's, what we can do is not ponder his nature, but ponder his attributes. All-knowing, all-powerful, all-hearing, all-seeing, living, willing, eternal, just, uh, speaking, uh, the beginning, the end, the outer, the inner, peace, uh, the punisher, the forgiver, uh, the Muslims are supposed to, uh, to meditate on the attributes of God because the nature of God is too great for us to, to um, So that's a general discussion uh, over, overall. Of course, Muslim scholars have spent a lot of time discussing the nature of God, but this is actually a very controversial discussion for Muslim scholars to get into. And there's a whole school of thought in Islamic theology that says that that discussion itself is inappropriate. That basically, God has communicated what we need to know about him in the Quran. And that's it. And if you start asking questions about that, you're, it's called code. Code literally means wading into something, like wading into the oceans where you're just going to drown. I don't know if that answers your question. Okay. Folks, it has been an absolute pleasure. I hope uh, it was interesting. <laughs>